Washington. Dr. Henry is a project scientist since 2001 at UC Davis Genome Center. She's a member of plant biology department with expertise in plant functional genomics, focusing on the effects of dosage and sequence variation in variety of crops, particularly in polypore species. So please join us and welcome Dr. Henry for her talk. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to the committee for inviting me here today. And also a special thank to Wasim for uh, the introduction and for organizing my visit here. So um, as he mentioned, I'm a project scientist. I am at the UC Davis Genome Center. Um, I'm hosted within the laboratory of Luca Komai. And in the lab, we are interested in polyploid species and in the effect of dosage and how dosage variation can affect gene function. Uh, we work on a variety of species, as you can see here. Uh, some of them are depicted on this, uh, on this slide, and they vary in a lot of ways. One of the ways is obviously a polyploidy. We work with diploid species, but also with um, autopolyploids, with, with several uh, copies of the same genome. We work with uh, allopolyploids, which come from interspecific hybridization. We work with uh, species with larger, larger genome sizes or smaller ones. We also work with some species that are clonally propagated. And each one of these species kind of have different requirements and um, different tools can be used to do uh, functional genomics on these species. So what I'm uh, going to talk about today is three different aspects of what we do. I'm just taking three examples of the kind of uh, questions or the kind of tools that we're using to um, look at gene function in these species. The first one is high throughput mutation detection. Then I will talk about dosage mutations in poplar. And finally, a mechanism of sex determination and persimmon, they're kind of widely different um, topics. So um, as you might know, our laboratory uh, hosts a tilling uh, facility. Tilling is a reverse genetic um, tool. It stands for targeting induced local lesions in genomes. It is essentially a tool for um, helping researchers find mutations in their genes of interest. So there is a population of mutants that has been created either by us or by um, somebody else. And we screen this population for uh, mutations, and then we provide seeds from these plants. And then they can do the hard work of figuring out what the gene does. Um, tilling has been around for almost 15 years, and the basic outline is still the same, which is that um, we create a population of mutant, either seeds or it depends on the tissue, but often it's seed. And often the mutagen is EMS because it is simple to use. And uh, this creates a population of N1 uh, mutant plants. I'm having trouble with the mouse too. There we go. This is then selfed because we want to ensure that the mutations are heritable. And this M2 population is what's going to be characterized. So we extract DNA from each of these M2 plants. And we also uh, produce an M3 self population. And those seeds are uh, kept for a distribution to researchers later on. So or very originally, at the very beginning of tilling, we were doing this by uh, doing a PCR on all of the applicants of interest and then putting them on these lovely polyacrylamide gels. It was very tedious. So um, it was too slow. <laughs> So um, about six years ago, I think now, we switched to uh, what we call tilling by sequencing, where we still PCR up our amplicons of interest, but we then put them on the parallel sequencer for um, determining mutations. Um, and that actually is still too slow. So um, between the time that a customer comes to us with a request for a particular gene and the time that we can tell them, well, here, is this, here are the seeds that have mutations in these genes, there is at least two, three, sometimes more than that uh, month. So um, what really we would like is a database of mutations that's available, and people can just say, I would like these seeds, and we can just send them to them. Um, and so what we have tried to do, we started with a pilot experiment in rice, where we did a systematic whole genome sequencing, and we've used exome capture to do that. So the basic principle is ex exactly the same. We're creating the population in the same way. This is a population of Nippon Vare seeds. They were treated with EMS. We went through the M1 and the M2. But then instead of uh, doing PCRs, we're now doing whole genome uh, sequencing libraries from each of these plants. And we are pulling them and sequencing them. This is where the targeted sequencing is very important because it reduces costs drastically. So just to uh, show you what this looks like, 
Um, for those of you who are not used to looking at Illumina or sequencing reads, this is an example of what it looks like. Every one of these little bars is a sequencing read that's been aligned to a reference sequence. Uh, they're color coded based on whether they go in the forward or the reverse direction. And this particular library is a whole genome sequencing library where you have more or less equal coverage. The coverage is basically the height of this stack of read here. We have more or less equal coverage across the genome. And this is great if you have the money to pay for all genome sequencing, all of your samples, but usually you don't. So you want to target your sequencing. And one way to do that is to do what is called exome capture where you select specific regions of your genome, in our case, specific exons of specific genes that you want to target. And then you uh, produce probes that will hybridize with those uh, sequences. And then that's a way for you to select those sequences to be, um, to be sequenced. Um, so this is what the reads look like in this case. You can see there is a strong enrichment. It's gone again. Oh, there you go. There's a very strong enrichment um, over the regions that we're interested in. So after the sequencing comes the bioinformatics and the mutation detection. Uh, we have um, developed a pipeline in the lab that we call the MAPS pipeline. It stands for Mutations and Polymorphism Survey. It's a very, very simple pipeline. Um, but I think the most important part of it is that we're using every sample as a control for all the others. So we're talking about mutation uh, here, and so the mutations are supposed to be random. We don't expect mutations to be found in more than one sample. The other important part is that often we have a reference sequence, but it's not from the variety that we're sequencing, or it's not sometimes not even from the species that we're sequencing. So comparing our, our uh, sequence data to the reference is not useful in our case. So we really want to just compare samples to sample. So this is just an example of what the data looks like. We have 20 samples here, one through 20. This is data for chromosome one positions 132 through 136. This is obviously not real data. Um, and um, here are the information that we have from the sequencing reads. And what the pipeline does is very simply go through each one of these lines and find situation where one sample, for example, here we have a deletion of this base and all of the other samples have an A allele. So that is called a mutation. It can be homozygous, it can be heterozygous, but what is not called a mutation is something that is found in more than one sample. Um, in the case of EMS mutations, we have a very uh, nice and convenient way of checking our work because EMS is expected to produce um, C to T or, A to, or G to A transitions. And so our set of mutations is supposed to overwhelmingly have uh, those two types of mutations. And this is what we actually use to set our thresholds when we uh, perform this mutation detection. So um, in here, I'm showing you uh, different levels of thresholds from um, I'm only observing the mutant allele one time. For example, here we have one A and a bunch of Cs. We're only seeing that A one time. If we do that, only 20% of our mutations are the expected EMS targets. So that basically means most of them are not mutations. Um, if we increase our threshold to three or even four, in this case, we picked four because then we had more than 90% of, um, of EMS expected mutations. This is what we see in rice. Um, if we go to wheat, this was tetraploid wheat. Um, the, the threshold that is needed to obtain the same level of a false negative is a false positive, sorry, is a little bit higher. Um, and the reason for that is because, um, well, it's a tetraploid, so we have homeolog genes that have some polymorphism that have to be distinguished from your mutations. And also because there is heterozygosity in the population, which wasn't the case for rice. So we can adjust our thresholds and and, um, and um, get a, a very good set of mutations this way. Of course, once we have a mutation, we don't know what they do. So we have a couple of uh, predictions that we run through. The first one is to find out wh whether a mutation is in a gene and where in the gene so that we can have a first assessment of functionality. Uh, there are some type of mutations that are very interesting right away. For example, when a stop sign, so we have a truncated protein, that is usually a good sign that the protein was not going to be functional. Um, having a splice size variant is also very interesting. But the most common category is this non-synonymous coding, which is a lot more difficult to assess. Um, to do that, we, uh, we use what is called the SIF score. This is an algorithm that was um, developed a few years ago. It basically uh, looks at um, homologous sequences from a variety of species 
and looks at the particular amino acid that is modified and sees if whether this particular amino acid is really conserved or not in other species and kind of gives us an idea. I want to stress out here, this is a prediction. Uh, this is the best we can do at this scale, at least for now, but, um, but it's a good prediction to give to uh, researchers. We just basically deliver them a list of plants that have mutations in their gene of interest. We tell them this is what CIF score is, this is where it is, um, your choice now. <laughs> So in our, um, in our pilot population of rice, we had only 72 mutants, M2 mutants, and we recovered 16,000 mutations. Um, and we estimate that there's a, at least one deleterious mutation for a, more than 2,600 genes, which is a, a very good start. Um, having this, this many mutations from a single um, um, variety was actually very helpful because then we can look at sequence context for the mutations in a way that was more difficult before. So we looked at sequence context in terms of nucleotides, and we can see an actual, actually a pretty nice pattern of um, around, so the targeted guanine is here in the middle, and right before it, we have an enrichment of um, A and G oh, nucleotides, and right after it, we have a, a C an enrichment in C nucleotides. So we, we can use this information to, um, to refine our, um, our targeting of which sequences we want to look at. We also, in RICE, were able to uh, correlate that with methylation data that was available for the RICE genome. And what we discovered was that um, if the cytosine right on the other side of the G uh, was fully methylated, then we had we observed a lot less EMS targeting than expected. This is what this black uh, distribution is for. And if it's not methylated, then we see. So it's as if the methylation was somehow protecting that particular base from um, EMS effect. So um, conclusions for this first part, um, we've, we think the method works pretty well. Um, the targeting sequencing allows for reduced cost maps. The pipeline provides a robust uh, mutation detection method. And the chromatin contest and sequence context is able to, um, is allowing us to optimize the target design. Um, it's a suitable resource uh, with about 2,000 individuals. We should have about 92% saturation on the exome. Um, there is now another population of rice for which we have about this many individuals, and there's a wheat population for which that's also available. So that means that ready to use a resource for the whole community is, 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 is very close. And then it's a very flexible system. So far, we've used it on rice, flax, cassava, wheat, and pepper. Uh, we designed the custom probes based on what the customer are interested in. Um, in RICE, we targeted most of the genes, at least one exon for most of the genes, and that was about 10% of the genome. In PEPPER, we're targeting only five megabase pairs, it's a much smaller set from a much bigger genome. So um, it's completely flexible in that way. Now, one way in which that is not flexible is that it's very difficult to use this strategy for uh, clonally propagated crops. So um, here are examples of such crops. Usually, they have a very complex genome. Um, they're often polyploid. They have a narrow genetic base, and they're very difficult to breed in a lot of cases. But the one good point about these uh, species is that um, any favorable variety that arise um, can be maintained clonally and integrated into breeding programs very rapidly. So we've um, applied the, um, a strategy, a different strategy for poplar, which is a clonally, rep reproducted, a clonally propagated species. So um, poplar breeding is based almost entirely on interspecific hybridization. We start from two uh, species and create the F1 hybrid. The F1 hybrid is heterotic, and uh, the ones that are most promising are then uh, put into clonal propagation. If we go through meiosis, we lose the hybridity. Um, in the case of poplar, uh, the trees that are currently in the breeding programs had been bred for pulp or for timber, and there is a, uh, there's a need for biofuel um, for, and poplar is a good candidate, except it hadn't been bred for it, and really the kind of characteristics that we're looking for are different. So we decided to try and um, create new variation in poplar by uh, creating a population of dosage variants. Um, we took um, female from a species called Populus deltoides and then crossed it for, with pollen from Populus nigra um, that was, had previously been irradiated with gamma. So gamma re results in double-stranded bricks. 
And so um, what we were aiming for is a population of trees that are slightly different in their chromosomal composition. So why do we want to do that? Um, as you know, uh, gene regulation is very, very tight network of a regulation, either positive or negative, between genes. Um, in the case of an interspecific hybrid, this is shown here with the, the two different species of poplar, we have a, a very specific kind of regulation that's happening that is potentially due to, um, responsible for a phenotype we observe, but overall it is, it is fairly uh, well regulated. If we add um, dosage variation to this, then we have a, a, a lot of disruption to this uh, stoichiometry. So if, in, if we have a deletion, we have, um, we have decreased um, expression of the genes that are located in the deletion. And similarly for the inser insertion, we have increased expression. But we also have um, effects on those trans effects that affect genes outside of the dosage lesions. And that can have even wider uh, changes in gene expression. So we're creating um, variation in gene expression on a broad, on a broad level. Um, one extreme case of those variations is aneuploidy. Aneuploidy um, represents the, any individual that um, carries uneven chromosome sets. So for example, one or two or more extra chromosome copies, uh, as shown here, can be in a diploid or in a polyploid background. Um, the chromosome mutants of Datura were the first aneuploids that were really discovered as such. But um, we all know that cancer is very tightly associated with aneuploidy. Um, and in humans, uh, very few aneuploidies are viable. Um, trisomy of also three copies of chromosome 21 or Down syndrome is, is the one that is the most uh, viable. In plants, somehow, um, aneuploidy is less deleterious. And that's especially so in tetraploid uh, populations. So this is an example of a population of tetraploid Arabidopsis. If we look at their chromosomal composition, we actually have about 25% of these plants that have one extra or one missing chromosome. And um, these are the ones that are um, noted, noted with the red dots. It's not obvious from their phenotypes that they're aneuploid. So in the case of a tetraploid or a polyploid population or in plants in general, um, aneuploidy is not as severe as we think. So how do we detect uh, these dosage variation? Well, um, we're a genomic lab, so we do sequencing. <laughs> um, we, um, it, in this case, it's very simple. We, um, we take our samples, we create genomic reads, and then we align them to the uh, reference sequence. And then we look at this coverage that we talked about before. And if the coverage is more or less even, we, we know we have the same number of chromosomes. If on the other side, we have a, um, a sudden increase or a sudden dip in coverage, then we can associate that with a, a, either an insertion or deletion. For our poplar trees, this is what the data looks like. So this is just one tree, and we have a dosage plot up here with 19 chromosomes. Each one of these dots represents 100 megabase pair, um, 100 kilobase pair of space. And um, you can see very easily that we have two dosage lesions here, one here where we are missing a piece of uh, chromosome four, and one here where we have an extra piece of chromosome one, beginning of chromosome one. So altogether, we have about 800 trees, and we've uh, detected about 1,200 lesions. About a three quarter of them are deletions, but we also have insertions, which we were surprised about. Um, and then also, interestingly, we have about 7% triploid in this population. This is not surprising um, interspecific crosses in poplar do produce a fair amount of triploids. We knew that, and we were kind of happy to find them here um, because they add subtle variation to our population, actually. So here we have four different uh, individuals, um, and each of them is the dosage plot is shown here. And we have one piece of this chromosome 8 at the beginning here that's depicted in blue. It's part of a dosage lesion in all four of these individuals. But whoops, um, the ratio of lesion to background genome varies in each of these. So for example, here we have um, four copies, four copies of this lesion in a triplet background. This is a tr uh, three copies in the diploid background. Here we have uh, two copies in a triploid and one copy in a diploid. So each one of these ratios is different and it allows us to have a very um, good series for looking at the effect of uh, changing gene uh, expression of the genes that are located in these lesions. 
This is a summary of the types of lesions that we have found. Each one of these little bars is a, a, an independent lesion. So there's one here, and there's another one here, and then one here, and then one here, and one here, et cetera. So there is about 1,200 total. As you can see, they're covering the whole genome pretty well. Overall, we have about 10x coverage um, across the genome, which allows us to compare individuals with similar lesions and look at their phenotypes. So speaking of phenotype, we are in the process of phenotyping. So um, I think we don't, we can't say much yet, except that most of the plants, most of the trees are growing well. They are uh, quite um, happy with those dosage those variation. Um, because it's a clonal tree, we are able to have clonal uh, replication. So we have three um, clones of each genotype in our field. Um, this is in Placerville, a little bit north of Davis. Uh, and we would also be able to replicate this tree exactly with this field exactly if we wanted in another, another location. Um, we have some data, but not much qua uh, quali quantitative data yet. Um, we can show you that there's a lot of variation. Basically, all of the traits that we're looking at um, exhibit a lot of variation. Uh, this is an example in, um, for leaves. We have uh, leaf, much variation in leaf size and shape and coloration. All of these leaves are taken at the same blastochrone, uh, but vary tremendously. We had um, a little draught experiment on the side where uh, trees were potted and uh, some of them were um, put through a draught a treatment and the others uh, controlled were not. And some of the genotypes did very poorly and others did very well um, in response to this draught experiment. We also have very interesting uh, wood phenotypes. These are called uh, viney. We have several of these and some of these leafy phenotypes as well, which obviously we're very interested in. Overall, we have very consistent results from the same clones from the same genotypes, which is um, encouraging. So uh, in this project, we have identified the F1s within DELS and we've pro propagated them to make clonal families. We are um, in the process of phenotypic characterization and defining the bin that might be responsible for the phenotypes that we are observing. And um, we will, the next step is going to do to obtain transcriptome data from all of these trees, which will do that in the spring and correlate that data with the uh, dosage information and the phenotypic information. Just as a teaser, we've looked, we haven't looked at much wood architecture yet because it needs, you need to destroy the tree in order to do that. But we have looked at a few and um, for example, this viney mutant has very, very um, in interesting wood architecture, very different from the control. And so we are, we're definitely looking into that and um, we were very happy to see that the lesions that these tree contain a uh, span a uh, part of the genome that contains uh, two transcription factors, WOX4 and WOX11, which are known to be involved in wood formation. Um, so that's it for this project. Uh, another side project that we're doing with this is to look at sex determination in poplar. And the reason is because we have another project of sex de uh, on sex determination in persimmon. So um, as I'm sure most of you know, um, there is about 5% of um, plants that are dioecious, which means that uh, the male and female's organs are found on different, or the male and female flowers are found on different trees or different individuals. Um, these um, dioecies are thought to have evolved completely independently in these different, different species, at least multiple times. And we're interested in trying to understand um, what are the mechanisms for sex determination in some of these species and also whether um, different species have found different solutions to the same problem. The um, reason we started working on this is because um, Takashi Akagi, uh, shown here, is um, uh, an assistant professor at Kyoto University, and he came to us for two years uh, to do a visiting scientist um, stay at UC Davis. And he wanted to understand how sex is determined in persimmon. Uh, but he came with Basically, he came with DNA and RNA, and we had no sequence information whatsoever. So it was an interesting project to start. Um, because of that, we decided to not work with the polyploid, but actually go to the diploid first. So um, uh, persimmon are part of the Diospirus genus. The persimmon that we know and eat are uh, from this species, Diospirus khaki, or Japanese persimmon. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is a hexaploid species, so a little more complicated to work with originally. 
So we uh, decided instead to focus on the diploid, which is diploid uh, Diospora's lotus. It's about a one gigabase per haploid genome. We now have a draft um, sequence, but it's not annotated or anything yet. Um, but at the time we didn't have anything, but it, uh, it is an XY sexual system, just like the human system with the XY males and XX females. Um, about 20 years prior to that, uh, Takashi's advisor, Ryo Tarotao, uh, created a, a population of sibling trees, a very, very simple cross, but one that takes time, um, where he took a male and a female persimmon trees and crossed them to each other to produce this population of trees. And now, finally, all the trees have flowered, and we can say which gender they are, <laughs> uh, which is very important for this experiment. So it's a long-term experiment. Um, so we then um, chose a certain number of male and female trees and made genomic libraries from each of those and then looked at all the genome, all of the sequencing reads and um, determined which ones were only found in the male trees. Uh, we then used um, different um, assembly methods to assemble these uh, male specific sequences and found about 800 contexts. Together, these contexts make up about one megabase pair of space, which we believe is um, most of the Y-specific sequence on the Y chromosome. At the same time, we used um, transcriptome analysis on the same trees to look for genes that were differentially expressed between the male and the females. This was in developing buds. And then we looked at whether these genes could potentially be located on these contexts that we had assembled and were Y-specific. And we found 22 candidate genes. Uh, two of them really stood out really fast. Uh, we called them Ogi and Megi. So they're homeobox transcription factors. Uh, Megi is kind of a regular gene. It's on the autosomes. Um, but Ogi um, is a pseudogene. It has uh, multiple mutations that disrupt the opening, open reading frames. But also importantly, it's completely absent in the females. And these two genes are very, very similar, with the exception of an inverted repeat at the beginning of OGI, which is the Y-specific gene. Also interesting, um, in the female expression of OGI, of MEGI is twice as high as it is in the male. So we did a bunch of um, experiments to come up with this model of sex determination in persimmon, in which um, on the X chromosome, um, there is no OGI. There is OGI only on the Y chromosome. On the autosomes of both males and female is the Maggie gene, which produces RNA and protein and somehow influences flower formation. We'll come to that in a minute. But then in the, on the Y chromosome is this OG gene, which um, can create a double-stranded RNA and produce small RNAs. We have um, actually did, um, seen these small RNAs. Um, that creates a population of small RNA on the Maggie transcript and represses its, exp its expression. Um, now, of course, what is the molecular function of MEGI? And we, are, we, we haven't really answered that question yet, but we have some information. Uh, MEGI and OGI are both uh, homologs of the barley VRS1 gene. Um, the VRS1 mutation has been identified multiple times. Uh, it's a very important one. Uh, um, as you probably know, it is the one that converted two-row barley to six-row barley. So a very big jump in, in yield. And uh, actually what VRS1 does is to repress these lateral spikelets. I will show you if the, uh, it's gone again. Oh, there it is. These lateral spikelets to produce um, full uh, spikelets in the case of the VRS1 mutant. And a different mutation in VRS1 also affect different aspects of flower development. What's interesting is that in persimmon, the um, male flowers are trifurcated. As you can see, one, two, three in the same way that um, the mutant virus one looks, and the, the female flowers have single flowers. We um, turned to overexpression in Arabidopsis and in um, tobacco to see if we could um, see a phenotype in, if we overexpressed a Megi in these species, and we did. So in both uh, Arabidopsis and tobacco, we obtained feminized flowers. So instead of having uh, these nice stamens in the control, we have reduced stamens. They're even more reduced in Arabidopsis. Sometimes they're barely visible. And um, both of these uh, produce pollen, 
even, well, maybe not this one, but these do <laughs> produce pollen, but the pollen does not germinate effectively. And again, in the case of um, tobacco, the controls had these multiple flowers and the feminized flowers were single flowers, just like in the female uh, flowers of persimmon. So then we had kind of figured out a pathway in diploid. We turned to the hexaploid to see if the, if the pathway was similar. So the hexaploid is a little bit more complicated. Um, there's two kinds of trees. They're either female trees, fully female, with six copies of the X chromosome, or we have monoecious trees, which have either one or two copies of the Y chromosome, and they have both female and male branches. The uh, presence of Augi is also fully associated with the presence of the Y chromosome in all of the hexaploid cultivars that we've looked at. Um, I don't need to go into detail here, but basically most of the pathways that we determined in the diploid is also present in the hexaploid. We see um, repression of Megi in the male versus the female, and we see a spike of small RNAs that are presumably responsible for this repression in the male and not in the female. The one big difference, though, is that we do not, we cannot detect expression of the Ogi gene, which is the white specific gene, in the hexaploid of persimmon. So this is uh, shown here. So this is actually how um, flowers develop in persimmon. We have um, buds developing in June, and by July, they are differentiated, and then they go dormant until the beginning of April. This is in Japan. And then um, in April, they, the flowers develop. And in the diploid species, we see very big spikes of the Ogi expression at both of these time points, which we do not see in the hexaploid. We think we know why we don't see this spike. We've actually sequenced the promoter region of Ogi, and in the hexaploid, we have a transposable element inserted right in the promoter element. And that, um, I don't know if I have this data, no. The promoter is um, heavily methylated, so we believe that's the reason why Ogi is not expressed. Um, this doesn't answer the question of why we have differential regulation of Megi. Uh, so then we turn to looking at methylation of the promoter of Megi, and we see a very big difference in uh, methylation between the male and the female, both in the diploid and the hexaploid species. And this difference increases as uh, time goes on. So this is the beginning of uh, bud formation and by late April next year where the flowers are completely formed, we have a very big difference in, in methylation of the promoter of Maggie. So, um, oh, I just one last piece here to this puzzle. So um, flower formation, the pattern of flower formation in persimmon is actually really interesting, at least to me, I'm not used to looking at this kind of, uh, of a pathway. Um, so each branch on a tree is either male or female. It's completely um, separated. Um, and so on the tree, on the branch is a bunch of uh, male flowers and then a bunch of uh, buds, which will create branches the next year. And so each one of these buds the year after produces branches. And in the case of a male branch, then most of the buds that come out are also um, producing male branches. As you can see here by the color of these little bars, there is a little bit of there's a little bit of variation. Sometimes the male branches will produce a female branch, but it's very rare. On the other hand, if we have a female branch, the buds that are here will produce mostly female branches if they're apical buds. But if they're basal buds, it's almost 50-50 chance of a male or a female branch coming out of that. So um, again, this is pointing towards methylation um, as a reversible switch for this uh, switch of gender. What we've done is to look at um, methylation and in those flowers where the, we could see sex reversal. So we, we had a male flower branch one year and the next year the, female was, uh, the branch was female, we had no methylation. And in the other direction, if we started with a female and then had a male branch, then we have methylation. So methylation was fully consistent with this year's um, gender, not the previous year. And lastly, if we look at those buds here that for which we cannot predict, which is the gender of the, the branch that's going to come out of these buds, and we analyze methylation on a bud per bud basis, um, about 50% of them are methylated and 50% are not. 
So this methylation reversal appears to occur very early in um, flower or in, in flower bud development. So this is our current model for what we think is happening in hexaploid persimmon. We have a very similar pathway, except that um, in addition, we have a very strong role for the methylation on the, the MEGI promoter. And we, we can have resetting of this methylation in both directions, although it seems like uh, de novo methylation, which is this um, wider arrow, is occurring much more frequently than, uh, than resetting and demethylation. Um, the questions that we're currently working out is, um, is OGI responsible for this methylation via the small RNA pathway, or is there something else that's responsible? We can't detect it right now, but it's possible it's a very short pulse or it's very tissue specific and we just don't see it. Um, we're also very interested in trying to understand what triggers this resetting of methylation on uh, the promoter of MEGI, and we're attempting to recreate the MEGI Ogi Megi regulation in our Rhodopsis and see if we can um, have any effect of known methylation pathways. Um, that's it. So I want to thank a lot of people involved in this project. So for the um, tilling project that I talked about, uh, our collaborators are uh, Tom Time and Jorge Dubkovsky from the Plant Science Department in, uh, at UC Davis, and also Edward Akunov's uh, lab at Kansas State. Uh, the Poplar Works is in collaboration with uh, Andrew Groover's lab from the U.S. Forest Service and also Greenwood Resources. And then uh, finally, uh, Takashi Akagi and Ria Teratara from uh, Kyoto University with whom we work on the Persimmon project. We have, of course, uh, very, very thankful for our funding sources. I just want to also put a little, bit, little plug here that we are starting to work on a new polyploid crop and we're going to have two postdoc positions available, one for breeding and one for bioinformatics. And, if you're interested, uh, please come to talk to me. Thank you. If I understand it correctly, you have shown that this uh, dosage, if dosage changes are due to either insertion or deletion, but it can it can be also due to multiple allelism. So my question is, how you differentiate in dosage effect whether it is due to insertion or deletion or due to multiple allelism? So you're asking me if I, how we can det determine whether it's due to the insertion or deletion or polymorphism in the parents? Yeah, how how you can differentiate the in dosage effect whether it is due to insertion or whether it is due to the multiple allelism? Right. So um, that's also part of why we are we want to get this tra uh, transcriptome data because we want to be able to determine which allele is present in each one of these trees, and also use that as a as a factor in the analysis. I have a second question. So, which part of plant you target induce mutations in rice and wheat, and is it vegetative or reproductive part, and how you maintain that? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Actually, is which, which part of plant you induce mutations in rice and oh, wheat? Right. Um, so I, it's both in seeds, so mature seeds. So how, how you maintain that? that mutation? You don't. So, <laughs> so that's why we go to the next generation. Um, so you're expecting to have mutations occur in all of the tissues of the seeds, and then the plant that grows out of that mutagenous seed is going to be chimeric. And then the next generation will have inherited mutations. Yeah. Uh, uh, currently, the EMS method have been applied only to seeds, or is there any like examples of uh, applying tilling strategy to like maize pollen from the castle? Ooh, EMS to maize pollen. I have not heard of that, but I am not really the person who would know the most about that. Uh, in the lab, I believe we have only ever treated seeds with EMS. Um, but it's not to say that you can use a different tissue. I'm not sure about pollen, because it would have to get into the pollen. Um, gamma is obviously better at that. Uh, I've heard about like a uh, tilling technology uh, being applied to pollen, but I thought 
Yeah, it's very possible. I just I just don't know about it. Yeah. I'm curious about in you mentioned about the maps pipeline. So if I identify a candidate gene in weight, can I order some mutant lines based the, on the pipeline? Uh, um, if you identify one in maize? The, the candidate gene in weight. In wheat? Yes. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, so the population of wheat is um, Jorge Dubkovsky's population. Um, I don't know exactly where they stand in distributing their population. They're just finishing the characterization right now. Is yours the same pipeline? The pipeline is the same? Yes, the same pipeline, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sada. So now next moving to student speakers. So I would like to welcome Jared Crane. 